are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, How Can Wireless Increase Workplace Productivity? I'm Ann Cosgrove, the Editor-in-Chief of Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar today is presented by Annexter and RF Connect. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. Please note the control panel that's on your screen. This is where you can submit questions in the question box contained in that panel. You can send in your questions at any time, and the speakers will address them after the presentation. Also, please note the orange arrow on the left side of your control panel. Clicking on that will either expand or collapse the control panel, so please be sure it is expanded so you can access the question box. Also, if at any time you experience a technical difficulty, you can send us a message in that question section and someone will respond to you right away. Now I'd like to introduce your two speakers today, John Caselli and Dave Sherman. John is Annexter's wireless manager for the Midwest. He graduated from Washington University in St. Louis, studying mathematics and linguistics. After a few years, finding fun in both but pursuing neither, John embarked on his great wireless journey. His unique pairing of a desire to be in the trenches with business owners, along with a proclivity for solving complex technical puzzles, found a home at Annexter as the company's wireless manager for the Midwest today. Bringing his technical acumen to real-world business problems quickly garnered John an industry position like few before him, and he continues to pursue increasingly intricate projects and is helping lead the industry in the implementation of the 5G and IoT standards of the future. Your second speaker today is Dave Sherman. He is Senior Solutions Engineer with RF Connect, and with over 25 years of experience in the RF and information transport systems industry, Dave has worked on numerous projects for Fortune 500 companies, as well as government entities, and these have involved both new and existing facilities. Dave has worked in numerous capacities in the industry, including 10 years of field technician and foreman experience. He has been an RCDD since 1994 and has been certified to engineer and install several OEM distributed antenna, antenna systems, that's DOS, and public safety wireless systems. Along with OEM, OEM certifications, Dave has attended numerous project management courses, including those sponsored by the Project Management Institute. Dave's project team at RF Connect has engineered, installed, and commissioned more than 500 in-building wireless DOS installs since 2008. So we'll, we'll look forward to hearing from both of these gentlemen today. So with that, I will hand it over to John Caselli. Hi, John. Hi, Ann, and thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody's uh, time today. So as Ann said, we're going to talk about how wireless can increase our workforce productivity within commercial buildings. So really what we're going to focus on is how can you capitalize on the tech skills of tomorrow's workforce? So a brief introduction for those who haven't been introduced to Annexter. Um, we've been around since 1957. Um, this slide is a little bit old. We're at approximately 9,000 employees globally. Um, we're in over 300 cities as a distributor with 320 warehouses and branches in approximately 50 countries across the world. Uh, we've been traded on the New York Stock Exchange under the stock symbol AXE for a number of years, and we're listed among one of the Fortune 500 companies in the U.S. So a brief agenda today, and Dave and I will do our best to uh, stick to this, but we're going to talk specifically about the commercial building workforce productivity. Uh, to include the drivers and challenges for employees, um, the change that we've seen over the past few years modeling workforce behavior, and then how that user experience is shaped with multiple screens and devices in the environments that we work. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about next network accessibility, excuse me, scalability, unified communications, and visual engagement of those devices, and then we'll touch a bit about the ecosystem, uh, including Annexter's channel partners, RF Connects as well, and then a little bit about the uh, the environment that we delve into with those OEMs. So we'll begin. So the drivers that Annexter has identified specifically for employee productivity um, center around the changing workforce behavior of today's workforce, um, the fact that we have multiple work locations um, that employees are in, and then specifically to those who employ these uh, young ladies and gentlemen, um, how do we manage the mobility of the employees themselves and specifically their devices as well? So we've got those as our drivers. So I'll highlight a little bit of the, a few of the challenges here um, that commercial enterprises face. So what we're finding is that companies are constantly challenged to get the most from their employees. 
Um, they're tasked with providing an environment for the workforce that is collaborative, allowing more freedom. Uh, and this needs to come with a seamless user experience when adopting some of these new technologies. Um, companies need to comply with corporate privacy and regulatory obligations. And as we look at existing building environments, you're limited by your current systems, or we refer them to them as legacy systems. And now companies must cater to a world where employees bring their own mobile devices. So now thinking about the workplace evolution that's occurred from the last 30 years ago to today, where we had dedicated administrative services, analog communications, and fixed location office cubicles, um, we've seen changes specifically in the last decade since the advent of the smartphone. Um, we've moved to a highly humanized clerical approach, uh, I'm sorry, from a, a humanized clerical approach to basically a self-managed world, uh, which is largely, largely based in the cloud. Um, we've been released from a fixed office location to enjoy a more flexible work environment. So examining the needs of the employees that haven't necessarily been in the workforce long enough to recognize those shifts, um, we find that the drivers for employee motivation tend to be very generational in nature. So as millennials represent a greater percentage and greater influence in the workforce, uh, we've seen an increase in app-based communication and a decrease in more traditional telephone-based method of communication. Uh, and a whole new set of employees rather essentially text than talk or use an app to send in a help ticket rather than pick up the phone and call their IT department. And this applies both in our personal and professional lives. Uh, most people today we found would rather purchase a product online from an Amazon or the like then pick up a phone or go to a brick and mortar to obtain that same item. So generations Y and Z, which kind of span the uh, millennial group there, uh, really believe that technology makes life easier and allows people to use their time more effectively. But given that, um, what we're finding is that's driving more devices and specifically more screens into more places. Um, taking a look at the number of devices we have available to us throughout the day, I would imagine most everybody on this webinar has at least two of these devices. Everybody's probably got a, a laptop and a smartphone, and we've become accustomed to being immersed in these environments to talk to us via digital signage. And most, if you don't have them already, um, are going to adopt the use of a tablet or a smartwatch as they become more affordable in the, um, in the market there. So every year, Cisco publishes a report called the VNI Report, uh, comes out every February. It looks at the previous year's uh, data usage, specifically mobile data usage, and then it extrapolates out uh, to basically <clears throat> predict a five-year trend. So what we've seen in the one that uh, Cisco released in 2017 is that in 2021, we're expecting 13.2 mobile devices per user, which was at, in the U.S., which was actually up from 7.8. Uh, in 2016. Um, now the challenge facing the employer or the commercial building is to provide sufficient high-speed bandwidth to support this anticipated growth in voice, data, and video traffic. Specifically to the traffic, just to attach some numbers to this, um, the numbers themselves aren't really important, but just think about the, the growth over a five-year time span. Um, the average uh, bandwidth speed is going to go to 75.5 megabits per second which is up from last year's 36.1 so nearly doubling uh, or more than doubling in, in speed and then the average uh, user is going to consume 237 gigabytes of traffic per month and that's across all those you know 13.2 devices and that's expected to grow twice as fast as fixed ip traffic so to address this challenge, we'll start by defining you know, your wired and wireless strategy, and we'll need to address specifically device volume and utilization. So increasingly, these devices haven't come from you know, your traditional corporate supply closet. So um, the acronym BYOD, if you're not familiar with it, is bring your own device. So we've found that these six questions kind of encapsulate some key uh, bring your own device strategy. So we'll need to take a look at which network and voice technologies you'll want to use. Um, will personal devices and corporate devices be simultaneously uh, able to commit to or connect to the same corporate network? Uh, will they be segregated in some way? 
Um, how is this initiative, if you have it or are planning to implement it, going to be funded? And then how is personal and corporate data on the same device managed across potentially two different networks? And then what mechanism is, is the corporation going to use to identify the user? Uh, what level of access control will they have based on who they are, uh, et cetera? So all that leads us to what we hope is gonna be some, uh, some concrete numbers to, to drive this home. So a crucial way to conceptualize the importance of workforce productivity is, is really to compare the various costs that a commercial building tenant incurs for energy, real estate, and then their employees. So we've got a 330-300 rule of thumb and figures across the country are gonna vary a bit, but the, as an industry average, um, the average cost of energy in a building is going to approximate $3 per square foot. Uh, cost of real estate outside some of the, uh, the outliers like a Manhattan or, or downtown Chicago, um, real estate's going to approach about $30 per square foot. But once you roll in payroll, benefits, um, all of the package that human resources would put together for an employee, um, we're at about $300 per square foot uh, in terms of how you, you would look at that as a, as a manageable asset. So clearly an organization's effort to improve productivity with technology can drive significant cost savings or an increase in efficiency. Um, now I'm going to turn this over to Dave Sherman at RF Connect um, so he can get into some more details. RF Connect is one of Annexter's uh, top wireless integrator partners. Um, and with that, Dave, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, hey, thanks, John, for uh, setting the table there. And uh, today, I just want to talk about uh, different types of wireless systems and how they're uh, growing exponentially. And I kind of like to start out with uh, going back about 10 years in time when all of us, a little over 10 years, were carrying flip phones around and uh, just using them for basic plain old telephone calls and some texting. And then the iPhone came along. And all of a sudden, this digital explosion uh, began to happen, and it crushed some of our carriers' networks. We know AT&T was the first to introduce it, and uh, they took a significant hit because uh, they didn't really plan for all of the growth that, or the success of the iPhone. And today, we're starting to uh, look over, over the horizon, and we see 5G coming, and we can see that, uh, once again, we're facing the same type of a, of a situation. Um, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, in terms of the growth of the devices, we see a chart here that's pretty useful. Um, we see all the different uh, types of devices people are carrying. John kind of alluded to. Uh, we have our personal computers, uh, smartphones, and tablets. Uh, many of us have more than one or two uh, in terms of tablets and wearables and all the different devices. Um, we also have connected cars. Um, that we're starting to add on to our wireless networks. And then we have this IoT, Internet of Things, and we see the, the growth in terms of millions. Uh, IoTs uh, projected as being the largest uh, contributor to growth on our, of traffic on our networks. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of another slide here, we see year-over-year -year growth in terms of wireless devices um, from 2017 to 2021, going from uh, upwards of 10 to approaching 30% in terms of devices. And all of us uh, that are planning uh, networks in, inside of buildings need to, to kind of comprehend and be able to plan um, for this additional growth. And now we know that Wi-Fi alone uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, proved up isn't going to be the solution, but we're going to have to have uh, additional wireless networks, which would include uh, cellular um, solutions. And John kind of spoke about uh, BYOD devices and bring your own devices. Um, we know that they're becoming more popular. We see that uh, currently about 89% of corporations or enterprises are at least planning on supporting BYOD. And uh, these will primarily be composed of uh, smartphones and tablets that uh, building uh, employees or visitors uh, will be bringing into the facilities. Um, I did some research and looked at uh, our workforce and how it's evolving. And uh, article in Forbes uh, brought out that by 2020, millennials are gonna compose about 86 million uh, people or 40% of our workforce. Um, so in order to attract the best talent, which is 
critical to all the businesses. Um, we want to be able to keep the workforce happy. And in terms of what, uh, they took a poll on what do millennials want in the workplace and how would they that bring them satisfaction? And we found that 88% prefer a collaborative uh, work environment. Um, they think of mobile uh, collaborations, drop in meeting rooms, flexibility in the workplace. And they want to use the same devices on the road, at home, in their cars, and uh, basically be able to roam about. 74% um, wanted flexible work schedules. And this uh, greatly increases their needs uh, for anywhere, anytime connections and connectivity uh, for cloud-based services, uh, their resources and tools of choice. 88%, um, and this is interesting, want work-life integration. I know that for a long time, everybody talked about work-life balance, but um, they seem to prefer work-life integration so that they can seamlessly roll from their workplace to their regular lives and activities and be able to kind of merge them together. Um, so work-life integration is important to them and uh, being able to bring in their own devices, obviously that supports that. Um, the next would be corporate Wi-Fi strategies. You know, we have to be able to uh, think about not only our corporate networks, but our guest networks. And quite often um, bringing in uh, people bringing in their own devices will help offload traffic off the Wi-Fi networks. But the carriers also in large facilities will use uh, Wi-Fi networks to offload uh, data traffic from their mobile plans. That uh, pretty much ties that up. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so there's a, a diverse array of in-building systems um, that are utilizing wireless uh, services. So on the, on the left side of the slide here, we see our carrier networks. We all know um, the AT&T's, Verizon, Sprint's, and T-Mobile's. Most of us have plans with them. But in the future, there's other providers that are going to be coming online as we start to move towards 5G and their more dense networks. We're starting to um, see Google and Comcast, Charter, and a lot of your traditional carrier uh, cable carriers um, looking to get into the cellular business. Uh, Wi-Fi, we know that it's emerging and growing. Um, 802.11ac, there's new technologies coming out that we need to keep up, and there's 5G as well. And then other systems. Um, we see that there's many other systems that we need to support more and more all the time. Uh, building management systems, um, access control and surveillance devices. Um, they put a lot of traffic on a wireless network uh, with live streaming video. And I guess last but not least, we need to talk about public safety and mass notification systems. So an uh, interesting story, uh, RF Connect and a lot of is a corporate member for Safer Buildings Coalition. And uh, Chief Alan Perdue um, is one of the, the leaders of that group. And uh, he took his daughter off to college. And uh, when they were sitting in orientation, it was kind of an interesting story he told that um, they go through all the classes and all of the things. And at the end of the presentation, they asked if there was any questions. And his question, of course, was, um, how are you going to ensure that my daughter's safe at school? So um, the presenter went into um, letting him know that they put in a mass notification system so that all of the students would register their cell phones. And if there was an incident, it could be weather, it could be, um, God forbid, a shooter or some kind of a situation like that, that all of them would receive text messages. So his next question was, um, what if she's in a basement or a building where there is not wireless coverage uh, from the carrier networks? And of course, he got a blank stare. So all of us need to think about uh, mass notification systems, the safety of our, of our occupants of our buildings and um, how we ensure that. So uh, next slide, please. So putting it all together, um, we kind of talked on the last slide about a lot of different types of uh, systems, a lot of different types of traffic. Uh, uh, we got voice, video, public safety, um, machine to machine, security systems. So you see this whole array. We want to be able to bring these all together into a heterogeneous network. And if we start planning early enough, um, we can put a lot of these different systems on uh, converged uh, wireless networks. Um, so next slide.
Um, so evolution of DAS, right? So we talked about the iPhone and how that was a game changer. Well, uh, today we're looking uh, on the horizon and we're starting to see uh, new frequency bands opening up. Um, the FCC is releasing um, some different spectrum to the carriers uh, to be able to uh, deliver all this increased capacity. Um, one of those is FirstNet, and that is, uh, that's an AT&T-led initiative, but basically that would allow our first responders to carry around um, smartphones instead of the traditional push-to-talk type radios and be able to feed real-time streams, uh, maybe look at building plans when they're going into a building uh, in an emergency situation. But there's a lot of different things that uh, are coming across the future, and uh, they're kind of listed out here. Um, but as you can see, we need to be looking ahead for um, all of these different types of technologies and try to plan today on how we would uh, have upgradable systems in the future. Uh, next slide. So we started talking about first responder radios and about first responder systems. And it used to be that they weren't required inside of buildings, but uh, over the course of the past uh, five to seven years, uh, the International Fire Code and the National Fire Protection Agency have found uh, these to be critical systems for first responders inside of buildings. Um, we kind of talked about they're usually these two-way handheld radio devices, but uh, potentially they could be video devices in the future. And uh, all of these uh, operate across uh, different frequency bands. Um, we've got VHF, UHF, 700 and 800. Uh, megahertz public safety bands. So um, you really need to understand which bands uh, need to be deployed in the buildings um, to meet the codes. And uh, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so what does it mean? Um, increasingly complex wireless networks and environments um, are driving the more demands on our users. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide and take a look at some of the different wireless technologies and networks out there. Uh, there's actually four here. You only see three verticals on the slide, but the first uh, on the left would be distributed antenna systems um, where they're for multiple carriers. Uh, you do, and here you've got three carriers. Uh, it could be AT&T, Verizon, and Sprint. Um, you bring them into the, the building via a carrier supplied signal source and uh, mix them all together. And then you can send them out over uh, fiber uh, to remote antennas throughout the buildings to re-radiate the, the signal. Um, in smaller buildings, you'd have a small cell solutions so where you'd have an RF source and uh, multiple antennas located throughout the building. Um, typically, there's not a, a fiber plant involved, but this would be for like less than 100,000 square foot buildings. And then, of course, we have our Wi-Fi uh, solutions that we need to be able to account for. And lastly, the public safety. Um, that can be a separate system or it can be integrated into a DAS. Uh, next slide, please. So what type of DAS do we need uh, to put into our facilities and what are the drivers? Uh, one of the first drivers is the, the, the type of facility we have. Um, it, there, you may be trying to uh, build out a network in a corporate office. It could be a mall, could be a government facility or a warehouse, it could be manufacturing, education facility or hospitality. But all these different types of facilities um, need different types of systems and they scale differently. And the second one would be the size of the space to be covered. Um, you said to certainly need a different type of um, network or wireless network for a small building versus a large plant or hospital. And capacity, your capacity planning, you know, what types of users are you going to have? Are they going to be doing a lot of video streaming? Is it a hospital where they're going to be trying to send some radiology, some really large files? Uh, does it need to be secured for HIPAA requirements? A lot of different uh, questions there that would, would lead to a solution. Um, what type of infrastructure uh, is in the facility currently, or what are you planning to put in? If it's a new building, um, you may be doing uh, fiber out to all of the users um, and to all of the jacks, as opposed to a copper, like a CAT 6A solution. And then uh, you may want to uh, implement with a coax um, type solution. And then you need to consider the building codes and what's required by your public safety and first responders. Uh, next slide. 
so the solutions we talked about how they vary by building size there's uh, very small spaces um, maybe up to 10,000 square foot you can cover them with the e-femto uh, it's a very small device that we, you'd put into uh, the facility it is a uh, single cell there might be one or two devices uh, maybe three or four antennas that cover the space then when you get up to the 80,000 square foot range um, there's a lot of different passive systems you'll see uh, over the air repeaters and uh, mini uh, type base stations um, that would be LTE devices only uh, is the next category and then in larger spaces uh, you end up looking at distributed antenna systems these can be uh, built out by uh, hybrid fiber coax systems um, they can be category 6a uh, solutions and or fiber solutions and several unique spaces um, like tunnels and subways, quite often those can be implemented with a leaky coax type solution. So uh, size matters in terms of planning. Uh, uh, next slide. So in terms of what's a DAS design look like? Um, this is a sample design. This is actually a category six implementation, but if you look at the left, left side of the slide, um, you'll see all the blocks there and those are all the different carrier signal sources. So um, these represent AT&T, Verizon, uh, T-Mobile and Sprint. So all of those signals, um, you bring them into the building and then you combine them all together into uh, one single device and then you digitize uh, all of them and send them out over single mode fiber out to the remote closets. You'll see when you start getting to the right block there. Um, there's different, uh, in different telecom rooms, you have different remotes um, that support multiple access points out in the ceiling space and you can see there's about 30 uh, across three floors now you can also do this with fiber out to the remotes instead of a cat 6a or it could be coax but everything on the left side pretty much stays the same so uh, next slide um how do we go about doing a design so it's really important that you pick a design firm or integrator that's uh has a lot of experience in uh, planning out systems and at what we're looking at here it's a heat map so uh, this is an actual floor plan of a building and then you can see the antennas uh, dotted out throughout the facility and then you see the the color legend um, the closest to the antennas you'll see the purple and then it goes to a red and an orange and a yellow essentially this is uh, the RF energy and it shows how it drops off the further you get from the antennas um, what's important about choosing the right design firm is that uh, this is uh, this design was done in Ivy Wave, and it'll actually allow you to plan the placement of your antennas so that you know when you get done with the build that it works. You don't have holes in your coverage. And the carriers, uh, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, T-Mobile, um, as part of their rebroadcast agreements and their contracts with the users, um, they require that you supply them with this type of a design so they can refer. Uh, review it and make sure that um, their users have the quality of service that they expect. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the DAS implementation and design strategy. Um, if you're looking at doing a new building or a new DAS inside of a system, there's several steps that you need to take. Um, in order to have a successful build and one is a needs analysis so the questions you'd ask is what carriers do i want on my network um, and then do i need to uh, provide the building space with public safety coverage is it something that the local authorities are required by code and then what do i want to do about wi-fi um, oftentimes you can merge uh, a lot of the parts and components of these networks together but it's important to understand before you you get started uh, what it is that we want to rebroadcast into the space um, the next thing would be a funding analysis what's it going to cost and who's going to pay for it uh, we can talk a little bit more about that later and then once we know what it is we try to do we can create a plan uh, after the plans created there would be some uh, initial testing is done in the facility so you'd have uh, a technician or an engineer walk around in the building and what he has is uh, quite often it'll be a backpack or a cart and it'll have a computer in it that's basically collecting uh, the existing carrier network um, 
signal levels is also making a short and long call sample calls out over the carrier networks and it's doing upload and downloads um, of data packets just to see what the existing rf environment in the, in the building is at the time um, once you know what the existing rf uh, conditions are in the building uh, you can create a preliminary uh, design and do a construction walk uh, quite often when we kind of showed the design in the, in the last pages. You do that preliminary and then you can you need to do a construction walk and, and say, can we really build the system? Are all these pathways accessible? Um, does it make sense? Um, next comes carrier coordination. So you'd submit your designs uh, to the carriers. Uh, we could use AT&T as an example. Um, so you'd submit that design uh, over to them. Their engineers would look at it and they would um, be able to tell you, yes, we can build it, or they'll make recommendations on how they'd like. Um, install all of the uh, cables and system components and then you'd begin the commissioning process where you turn the system on and once it's on you do system performance testing um, you'd repeat that benchmark testing where you walk around and sample the signals after the install to make sure that your design objectives have been met and that your system's properly performing and then you can need to think about optimization and after that maintenance um, and how you want to go about maintaining your system. And just a, a little different view of it in the flowchart type mode. Here you see the implementation process right from the start and your needs assessments. Uh, and then creating your plan is the end of phase one. And then uh, part two is preparing for the build, um, you know, selecting contractors, ordering equipment. Um, we know that Annexter has all of the equipment available to us. Um, they do a great job in John's team and then you move into the implementation and uh, completion of construction and the system becomes operational and then you're into maintenance and monitoring but this is a flow chart that rf connect follows on all of our projects and it's something that when you're working with the integrator you want to query them if and make sure that they follow all these steps and have a detailed plan like this So then who pays for it, right? There's in the past, and we go out and we'll, we'll call on a lot of uh, a lot of clients that want uh, distributed antenna systems. They want the carrier networks brought into their facilities. And uh, quite often they're looking for somebody else to pay for it. We know in the past, going back five, six years, worked on a lot of projects with carriers and they were actually paying to have distributed antenna systems put in their clients' buildings. Um, a lot of those were stadiums, large hospitals, very public areas, uh, concert venues, areas like that. Um, those days are somewhat over. So uh, now the carriers are pretty much, their pocketbooks are, are closed. They're not uh, paying for many systems. So we get to the next where um, the carrier and the building owner um, can somehow fund the system together. And a lot of times our carriers, AT&T, don't they'll provide a signal source inside of the building and get their signal in there. And then it's up to the building owner to build the DAS out um, beyond that inside of the space. Um, the third option is the building owner pays for all the costs. Um, there's advantages to this in that we talked about how there was multiple carriers and some new carriers even coming along. It could be Google, it could be uh, Charter, it could be Comcast that may be getting into the, the cellular uh, marketplace but what this does is if you pay for the data so you have the ability to switch uh, from one carrier to the next and make changes on your networks um, and the fourth option is third party operators there's uh, the extanets mobilities american towers there's a lot of third parties that will come in you can sign a multi-year agreement with them to basic they will basically manage your manage your wireless or your DAS environment and they'll pay for your DAS once they have the first carrier on board. Um, so they don't really start anything until an AT&T or Verizon um, agrees to jump on board. So you could be stuck uh, waiting for that first carrier to join. 
And lastly, there's other creative funding models. Um, we heard recently about um, some organizations that'll sign 20 year contracts and essentially uh, build out or pay to build your DAS and they'll pay to upgrade it and you pay a monthly uh, recurring fee for that service. Um, so let's talk about what to look for in a partner. We saw this, uh, all the phases of the design process and how it's critical to plan it out. Um, so what you're looking, going to want to look for is somebody with a nationwide footprint um, that has relationships with all the major wireless carriers. Um, so what they understand exactly what the carrier requirements are um, in the area that uh, you're trying to deploy a network. Um, you want somebody that's got OEM training and certifications on the systems they're going to install. Um, and uh, somebody that has some success, if you're working in large projects, a lot of times there'll be union labor that'll be involved, somebody that has some experience uh, in those tougher labor markets. Um, you wanna look for somebody that has FCC licensed engineers, um, general radio operators licenses are required for the testing and certification of the public safety systems. And you also want some people that have some design experience uh, with RCDs on staff and project managers uh, if they're pmp certified of course that's a plus um, they bring out the right kind of experience to um, your build and ensure success um, you want somebody that has their own design tools and equipment um, quite often uh, some competitors will outsource designs some of them are outsourced overseas uh, sometimes they outsource the testing so you really don't have a comprehensive um, beginning to end uh, type solution is uh, pieced together. And then uh, Wi-Fi, public safety first responder experience. Uh, we starting to see that more often you wanna be able to merge these networks together. And now we're moving towards IP infrastructures. Um, so uh, obviously have an IP um, experience um, is a plus. So, um, RF Connect, uh, we, our approach is that we want to be a technical advisor and to educate our clients, to help them assess their needs and determine and design the best uh, solutions for wireless uh, networks to fit their, fit their needs. Um, RF Connect is recognized as a leader in the industry. Um, we're trained and experienced in deployment of all the major equipment manufacturer systems. So um, we're not, uh, we're not keyholed into one manufacturer. Um, we really look at the best uh, solution for our customers' needs. Yeah, so uh, we, RF Connect's been doing systems since 2004. We have well over a thousand uh, installed at this point. Um, we worked in uh, healthcare facilities, commercial real estate. You can somewhat see the list here, but just about every type of environment with successful implementations. And we have multiple uh, offices across the country um, to serve your needs with local resources. And lastly, just to recap, what we do for our customers or what you want an integrator uh, to do for your customers is to assess their existing conditions and communications, um, build out networks that are gonna eliminate their dead, spark, their dead spots and uh, certify their networks and, and be able to provide ongoing monitoring, maintenance and support. And uh, RF Connect has our own NAC 24-7 uh, call out. So um, that's something that you wanna to have uh, your integrator or your partner uh, have that capability. And we're on the Q&A. Great, great, thank you, Dave. Thanks very much. This is Ann Cosgrove again. Uh, thank you, Dave, and thank you, John, for the presentations and for, uh, you covered a lot of ground there and we appreciate that. And uh, attendees, please feel free to continue to send your questions in and we'll have some Q&A now, uh, touching on some of the topics you've talked about. So I will just put this out to both of uh, you gentlemen. Let's talk about first, uh, in the beginning there, there had been some mention about the expected and, and ongoing increase in uh, bandwidth and, and uh, demand for data by, by users and occupants in, uh, in facilities. So can you talk about how the systems that you've talked about today can handle uh, 5G technology? Give a little bit more background on that. Yeah. 
Yeah, so as we see um, the emergence of 5G, it's going to be a much more, uh, much denser uh, build out. There's going to be a lot more uh, antennas, a lot more remotes. Um, each remote will cover um, a much smaller footprint in terms of square footage. And uh, it's going to place a lot more demands in terms of capacity on a system. So um, the way to plan for a network is to build out a network that's got CAT 6A out to the edge or fiber to the edge to support the capacity of 5G. It's going to be about a tenfold uh, increase in, in traffic uh, that 5G is giving. So uh, 6A to the edge or fiber to the edge um, seems to be the way to go. And, and Dave, you mentioned a ten time. I'm sorry, a tenfold increase. What period of time is that expected? Is there a timeline expected time? Yes. For that? Yeah. So that's been a little bit of a moving target, but what we're hearing now is um, 4G is going to run on the carrier networks through about 2020, maybe 2021, and then 5G will uh, emerge and start to take over. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, also, we have another question about um, actual. Uh, operation and, and kind of maybe st some strategy around John's portion of the of the webinar, and that was about the BYOD um, demands that are coming around. Bring your own device, and that was back on slide ten. Maybe we can go back to that for a minute. Um, and and John, the question is, um, can you share any kind of challenges that Annexter or maybe RF Connect, uh, Dave, if you want to jump in, any challenges you've seen um, with your clients in terms of just even getting their hands around uh, implementing a BYOD policy. Um, any any kind of things that, that stand out that you can share with our attendees today where they might be able to bring that back to their their work? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's two parts to it. So one is the actual, um, you know, company protocol or initiative to do so. Uh, and that's, you know, something that's, uh, I don't want to say a little bit more mundane, but it's a little bit easier to plan for, right? So how, how are, are we going to restrict the type of device? Uh, is it going to go out to um, a single carrier like an AT&T or a Verizon, or, or is it just uh, essentially a free-for-all, right? Um, are you going to allow anybody to bring any device from any carrier on? And does that include simply just uh, phones, smartphones? Is it tablets? Is it wearables? Um, so once you've gotten those questions answered, and those are probably more um, either financial driven or security driven, um, operations driven, if there are certain um, apps or protocols or programs that, um, that one needs to run on a day-to-day -day basis, that will sort of lead you to those answers. But once you've determined that, um, the strategy then is, uh, or the question is how do you implement uh, a wireless service within a building to, to serve that? So. Um, the engineering needed to put in something that serves a, a single carrier with a, a restricted device a set is uh, vastly different than just the, the free-for-all method, right? So um, as Dave had on there, uh, the, the RF predictive analysis or heat map, um, that looks different depending on the density of uh, devices and the number of carriers you have on a system. So as you double the number of carriers, the, the power output halves um, with each doubling, and that's something that a, a design would have to take into account, right? So if you're on a single carrier system versus four, um, you know, not only is there a little bit of a, of a, you know, a space consideration for the equipment, but really where you're putting um, antennas or, or access points within the ceiling matters as well. Um, Dave, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, not a whole lot, just that, like you mentioned, um, every time you double the carriers, then, you know, there's there's an impact on the coverage area. So uh, the more carriers and the more load you have on the network, uh, the more devices you need. And like you said, more space uh, is required, more infrastructure. And you want to plan for worst case to start with. It's easier to plan for the worst and uh, hope for the best. And what do you mean by worst? Is that, uh, you mean in terms of demand? Yeah, in terms of demand, like, uh, you know, you want to be able to plan on uh, demand for the future and build out your network or your, your infrastructure to support the future needs rather than just today's. Okay, that makes sense. And that kind of ties in a little, um, a little bit to the previous question too, right? So there isn't a 5G standard yet, um, but we have a good idea of what it, it starts
starting to look like. And as you're looking at um, each of the carriers, they seem to have a, a strategy or a kind of an idea of where they want to take it. And that's, that's starting to emerge now. So um, if you are looking to plan for the future for a single carrier system, um, that set of you know, future build outs might be a little bit more uh, narrow than you know a full-blown four carrier system right so Verizon's strategy for how they implement and use 5g is not necessarily going to be the same as AT&T's and that includes you know the technologies they use the the mobile devices they support as well as you know maybe the frequencies that need to be on that system too um, so that's something that's kind of an unknown now but it is something that we're able to plan for and the carriers um, have an incentive to to not necessarily share, <laughs> but kind of keep it um, uh, top of mind for everybody implementing these systems because they obviously they they have uh, an incentive for their devices to work within buildings once this uh, system is built. So that that's something that they would communicate down with um, you know to to Dave and his team. Uh, if Dave said, "Hey, look, I'm I'm looking at this uh, system within this building." Uh, not only are they going to vet uh, the system as RF Connect designs it now, but they'll say, okay, well, you might also want to consider that we're planning for XYZ too. Great, thank you. Okay, so so then we'll move on to uh, jump around to a different topic uh, as far as uh, securing the systems uh, in in the facility. Uh, I'm sure, as you both know, and our attendees are fully aware of in their work, that um, securing any new uh, tech systems in their in facilities, it brings in another concern, and I uh, just want to know a little bit about what kind of security concerns you deal with and how those are addressed with these types of systems you've been talking about today. Well, I'll go ahead and, and start, but I'm sure Dave will have a little bit more to add. So, obviously, the, any type of uh, you know company-owned equipment or assets has to be physically secured, but I'm assuming the question is, is more along the lines of, of um, digital or data security. Yes. So the um, the great thing about a, a distributed antenna system is because it essentially replicates the outdoor cellular network, it's as secure and privatized as it would be if, if you were out um, on one of the carrier's networks um, outside roaming to, from their towers, um, which is, is it's highly secure, it's highly proprietary, um, which, which is a good thing. So uh, more along the lines of the uh, public safety or the Wi-Fi um, for a public safety DAS, um, it's again just as secure as um, fire or police. Now they they don't have all the, the protocols that the private entities like AT and T and Verizon um, might, but there's there's less of an incentive and, and there's not corporate data usually on that network. You have to have it for uh, for events that you never hope happen. Um, Wi-Fi is really, the, in my experience, the main concern. And in addition to the physical infrastructure being um, secured, uh, the typical considerations are, you know, where are my open ports? Um, and then it comes down to, you know, software and segmentation to, to really keep that, uh, that in check. And, and it's really uh, up to the IT department to come up with a robust plan. Um, you know, how do you prevent uh, an incident or a a, a, you know, a, a data breach, and then in the event that you do uh, have one, how is it discovered, and how quickly do you react and and move on that too? Yeah, I guess I would just add to that, John, that you kind of went into the fact that the carriers really take care of the security of uh, their wireless networks. And the great thing about having a DAS in your building is you're getting all of the traffic that might be. Um, out to could be private sites like Facebooks or Snapchats or any type of messaging. Any of that traffic is off of your network now and uh, doesn't have to be secured. And then you're not firewalling out or restricting sites and having to deal with uh, with that out on, on the carrier's networks. It's just part of your Wi-Fi. Great, thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. So yeah, so we will um, we'll begin to wrap up. We do have uh, some questions about after the install and uh, maybe some maintenance uh, issues, not issues, but maintenance uh, topics. So what is the, I'll ask them together, what is the typical refresh cycle on these systems after installation? And then what type of ongoing expenses can a facility manager expect? 
Yeah, so in terms of the refresh uh, cycle um, on a distributed antenna system, um, we're seeing that you're wanting to start doing upgrades um, in the three to five year range. And if you plan the system right and you have a modular type of a system, there's several of them out there, uh, you can actually change the radios out in the closets, um, add frequency bands on them. And those are the kinds of changes we see three to five years out. In terms of entire platform changes, um, that's something that's out in the seven to 10 year range or whenever whenever technology changes significantly enough that uh, the hardware we're utilizing is no longer effective. And uh, 5G is definitely gonna put a strain um, on the networks as we don't know exactly what that looks like today. Are you installing systems uh, into facilities now with the 5G capabilities in mind? I mean, is that something you're you're putting in place already? Yeah, so the designs we're doing today, we, we try to make uh, the backbone or all of the, the cabling, the fiber optic cabling going out to the remotes and throughout the facility and all of the cables in place capable of supporting 5G. But we really don't know what that hardware is going to look like and if today's um, equipment is going to be upgradable until, uh, until that uh, standard gets uh, finalized. Okay, understood. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. So, and then just our, our last question there, um, what type of ongoing expenses uh, do facility managers, uh, can they expect, you know, what are they responsible for as the, as the uh, operator and perhaps owner, probably most likely operator, at least of the, uh, of these systems? Yeah, so typically the facility will pay for all the costs of the electrical, all the heating, all the cooling, um, all the maintenance of the equipment. Um, sometimes there's UPSs and, and those types of things involved. So uh, generally that's the ongoing maintenance um, that's required. And then of course, any upgrades that would be required to bring on uh, additional bands. If the carrier is paying for the system, quite often they'll help foot the bill. Um, and if not, then that falls into, um, into the system owner's uh, domain. Thank you. And actually, one last question. Uh, in a scenario where Annexter and RF Connect have worked together on a project, uh, as far as the maintenance or the um, checking up on the system, do one of your companies visit that facility, um, you know, on a, on a whatever time basis? Who stays in touch with the facility person? Um, how, do, how does that work? So in terms of uh, a DAS or a Wi-Fi system, um, RF Connect offers uh, maintenance agreements where you'd get annual system checkups. Um, we actually um, can monitor the systems remotely and uh, see when problems will get alerts or alarms when there's troubles on the networks. And of course, then we can respond to them, um, dispatch uh, a, an engineer out as needed. Um, so it's annual checkups and then maintenance is needed. And then uh, Annexter, they've got great relationships with the new clients. Um, and I guess, John, you could kind of elaborate on how you support clients there. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Annexter doesn't implement or, or do a, a health check on the system, but certainly, you know, in the systems that RF Connect and Annexter have installed together, um, we have relationships with the, the end client, um, usually on a day-to-day -day basis, but, um, typically, we're always open to somebody saying, hey, I, I'm not sure it's working like it's supposed to. I know there aren't alarms, but I'm experiencing something. And we would communicate that back to, uh, to RF Connect, and they'd be able to maybe do a little bit of investigation that if, if there's not an alarm on, um, maybe something's just slightly off. But um, certainly, we, we would happily pass on any information or any questions one of our customers has. Great. Great, thank you very much. So, uh, so it looks like we'll, we'll wrap up from there. And I do want to uh, encourage attendees to send any follow-up questions to to John uh, and or Dave, and their contact information is uh, on your screen there. So, uh, thank you again, uh, John and Dave, and uh, Annex and RF Connect for sponsoring this webinar, and of course to our audience for attending today. A recording of this presentation will be available online at facilityexecutive.com as well as at the Annexter website and the RF Connect website. So thanks very much again and have a great afternoon.